what the Gospels say to us about fear, both constructive and destructive. And I guess I would start this off today, and this is always an intimidating question, I think, with some people. But if I were to ask you today, what is your greatest fear? What, does anyone feel comfortable enough to answer what is your, what's your greatest fear? I mean, is it growing old, dying? Is it living? <laughs> is it, uh, what, what, when you think about it, we all have fears. Some of them are very deep and very personal, and we don't feel like that we need to share those a lot with people. But in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 24, I want to read about six or seven verses of Scripture. Jesus here speaking said, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Belshazzar, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So three times here, four times maybe, he mentions do not fear. Do not fear in life. So... Jesus made it plain here, and we're living in a time to when we're not really too sure because of the angst and the anger that's going on today, whether we might find ourselves under attack today for what we believe, for the stands that we take. It's, it's very common today for if people take a stand that is outside, let's say a liberal ideology or something like that, people will either attack a person personally, they will attack them socially, uh, you know, but, but Jesus made it cl plain to us that we were not afraid, we're not supposed to be afraid of those who can kill the body. Now, I'm sure there's not a one of you here that would want to be killed, right? I sure don't, and, but that is a tall order when we think about that, you know, and there were people in the Bible, of course, and there's been people since then, martyrs for the faith. And Hebrews chapter 11 in particular brings out a bunch and that did not even have names. But the Bible says they refused to be set free. They refused because part of the condition on some of their releases were that they disavow God. They disavowed Jesus and they wouldn't do it. It would have been simple for them to say, okay, I say I... I denounce God and then walk away. But many of them were tortured. They were flayed. Their skin was cut off of them. They were burned as torches, in, especially in Nero's garden. Uh, he used them as sport and, and, and used them for light in his garden as he burned them to death. So, you know, no one uh, relishes that of any way. But why would he say to us to fear not them that can kill the body? I mean, isn't it obvious through this scripture that that's all they can do? They, they, if, if a person is going to do that, the greatest thing they can do is only is put your shell to sleep. They, they put your body. That, they can't touch your soul. They can't touch your spirit. They can't touch anything else about you. Because if you're God's child and you leave this world and you leave this body, this shell is just going to decay and go back to the dust of the earth. So he, he says not fear them. Now, we see, 
we, we see that that is a fearful thing with a lot of people. If, if someone is standing and has a gun pointed to your head and is telling you to give them uh, your wallet and things of that nature, I mean, you don't, most of the time, you don't just turn around and say, well, I ain't scared of you shoot, man, if you want to shoot. You know, because we value life and we want to live. And there's wisdom in the fact of not agitating someone who might take a personal item that can be replaced versus a body in, here on this earth at camp. So he reminded us in, uh, uh, in, in the scripture that he says, I am sending you out. As sheep in the midst of what? Wolves. So in other words, he was telling us that we're going to be in a place to where it's going to be perilous. At times, it's going to be dangerous. And I, I, I guess I would ask you this from, let's just, I can say from a year or two years ago. Do you feel like the danger, the personal danger level has gone up or gone down in the last two years? It's gone up because there's, 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 there's threats and threatenings that we feel sometimes because of stances you take or as Christians even, you know, knowing that we could quickly come under persecution. So he says, I'm sending you out, you know, in the, as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, let's look at a few of the saints of God in the scripture because they are our comfort and they are our strength in life. Moses, the Bible told us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25, and let me turn right there. I'm doing it just the old manual way tonight. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. It says this. Choosing, well, let me just back up verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. Because they saw he was a beautiful child. And listen to this. And they were not afraid of the king's command. What was the king's command? Do you remember? All the male children were to be slaughtered, basically, at their birth. So verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible." So Moses' strength here was the faith that he had in God. Although he could not see him, it says he endured. He made it. He lasted because he had an internal faith in God. And it caused him not to fear people who tried to dominate and the Lord authority over him. Now, I believe if we stay here long enough, and if something's not corrected in this land today, you and I are going to come under greater faith, I mean, greater threats for our faith, greater threats for our politics, greater th threats for everything in our life. Because Satan cannot stand the gospel. He cannot stand the light to be shed abroad among us. And therefore, he's going to try to extinguish and make um, an end to anything that threatens his way of destruction. He is a thief. He comes to steal and to kill. But Moses was not afraid. He did not fear the wrath of the king. We must not fear the wrath of our government. We must not fear the wrath of, of other social, economic groups, whatever they may do. How many of you know we endure by seeing, by faith, him who is invisible, and through that we will overcome? Amen? The three Hebrews in the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were not afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, if you have your Bible, you might want to go there. Daniel 3 and 16. Let me, boy, it's been a long time since I've thumbed through a Bible. Daniel. There we go. Daniel 3 and 16. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Man, that's bold, you know what? I mean, for just to flat out come out and tell them this is the most powerful man. Nebuchadnezzar, was his, his kingdom was not ruled by advisors. He was in charge himself. He did what needed to be done. If he said you died, you died. If he said you lived, you lived. And these three Hebrews just simply said, you know, you've commanded us to bow, and we're not bowing. We will not worship your gods. We will not bow down in that way. So they did not have the fear of that. Also, in Daniel chapter 6, and uh, Daniel chapter 6, uh, verse 1, we see that we're, the people who were against Daniel went to King Darius and had the decree signed that if anyone worshipped or made any prayers to any other deity other than King Darius himself, they were to be thrown in the lion's den. And you know this story over and over. We've been studying the book of Daniel. That when Daniel knew the decree was written and signed against him, what did he do? Got any guesses? He prayed. He went up into his room, opened his window towards Jerusalem, and he prayed. Just like he always prayed. He was not putting on shows. He was not putting on airs. He did what he did every day. He repetitively did that. And he was not afraid to do it. Maybe God's going to speak to some of us to pray in public. To pray out loud for someone. To pray, um, you, you know, and uh, Denise was watching a video this week of a preacher we know that has been her mom's pastor at one time. And he was at work, right? He worked for the city of Baldwin, I think it was. And they've got this video of him, and it just was pointed down to the ground, but we know who it was because it, it showed him. And they just got to talking about the Lord, and all of a sudden, he just broke into preaching. And I don't know how long he just preached right there to the employees of the city of Baldwin, you know. And... Um, so we, we've got to be obedient regardless, you know, of what God tells us to do. Another friend that she grew up with and that I'm friends with also, he told me one day that he used to go to the cattle sales all the time over in Carnesville, Georgia. And he said one day when he went to the cattle sale, how many of you ever been to a cattle sale? Okay. But he said a cattle sale is just like a big arena and it has all these bleachers in it and these cowboys and farmers are sitting there bidding on cows as they run them through this gated area. So they're all, in those days, are smoking, chewing tobacco, spitting, whatever they got to do in there. And Anthony said, God told me that he wanted me to preach to them before the cattle sale started. And he said, Lord, I mean, I ain't never. And so he went to the guy that ran the cattle sale, and he knew him. He was friends with him. He said, look, I'm just going to tell you what the Lord told me. He said, the Lord told me that he wanted me to preach before the cattle sale. And he said, that guy just kind of looked at him. He said, well, I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. He said, it's up to you. He said, don't you lay that at my feet, the man told him. And so when he realized that he was serious, he turned him loose. And he preached about 10 minutes before the cattle sale. <laughs> and he said, people got up and walked out. But he said, also, he saw guys standing there in tears were streaming out of their eyes as he preached the gospel. But it's fear of failure. It's fear, fear of what someone would say about you. Fear what they would go away and say, this idiot preached at the cattle sale. Can you believe that? Or this person did this and that. But we cannot fear that. And Daniel did not fear. Stephen was one of the deacons in the Word of God. And in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, let me just turn there. Right. Acts 6 and verse 8. It says that, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Well, y'all know what happened. He started preaching. He started from the days of, 
of Moses and all the way up, he preached the gospel about Jesus coming. And the Bible says that the people that were watching him said his face literally glowed and radiated as he preached. But they, they were under such conviction, they began to clench their teeth. They began to, the, the enemy fired them up. And all of a sudden, they're picking up rocks and they're picking up stones. And before you know it, Stephen is being stoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus. But what did he do? He kneels down and he looks up and he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the heavenly father, getting ready to welcome him in. But he feared man not. He did not fear. He spoke what he had to say. And I don't know if this is going to be for us coming up or not. But God is going to allow us even, you know, as I was telling you last week, we had this wreck out here. You know, men vet pretty well witnessed the whole wreck when the wheels rolled off of the dually and another car caught the wheels coming down the road destroyed his car and you know and I'm seeing this man eventually stand out there by himself I went out there to start with and then I was watching him again when I came back in and I thought I need to go out there and say something to this man about he's lucky to be alive is he a church man and I you know I felt intimidated to even do that because I didn't know him from anybody you know and thought he might tell me to get back across the road and just mind my own cotton picking business you know but I went out there and told him I said man I said I don't know I don't know where you're at with church or where you stand, but I said, you know, you're lucky to be with, alive. And he said, well, I'm not much of a church-going feller, you know. And I said, well, maybe it's a good time that you start. You don't have to preach a theological sermon to somebody every time that you run into them. But if you can prick and awaken the conscience of somebody about their mortality, when someone could have took those tires right through the windshield and they could no longer be with us today, so think about that sometimes, that it's not, it's not how you can impress someone. It's not whether you have the THD or the DDD or whatever it is in, in theology to just be you and be, don't be fearful. I, I, you will be, but I'm just saying don't be. Overcome it so that God will help us to do what he wants us to do. So Paul even wrote to Timothy about his own coming death. For he said it this in, in 2 Timothy 4 and 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And then to the uh, church at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. He says for me. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You know, and I think Cheryl and I were talking today about how many people are leaving. Man, we've seen so many people dying. And, um, you know, Brother Jerry, Sister Darlene left us, what, this week? Last Friday. She's been here to our church, a precious soul. And, um, but she's better off today. She's gained now. So, but, but she wasn't fearful to talk to you about the Lord either, you know, and there's going to be great reward for that one day. Now, you know, there are two elements that will deliver you from destructive fear, whether it's the fear of death or life, the fear of failure or loss, the fear of people, position, or the fear of rank and power. And first of all, that is faith. If you want to overcome fear, faith overcomes your fear. How many of you would agree with this statement here? You cannot trust God and be fearful at the same time. Now just think about that for a minute because you think you can. But it's like salt water and fresh water cannot what? flow from the same fountain. Why? Because one will infect the other, you know. And so the same way with our faith versus fear. In order to do, it, it, see, it all hinges upon the word trust. To literally trust means that you're devoid of fear. It doesn't mean that you won't have anxiety. It doesn't mean that you won't question or this and that. But your faith will conquer your fear. So you cannot trust God and uh, fear at the same time. In Psalm 56, in verse 3, I think I'm just going to go to Psalm 56. I was reading that before church, and it, it really uh, spoke to me. 
uh, Psalm 56. This is a psalm of David, a prayer for relief from the tormentors. He said in verse 1, Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. For there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Listen to what he says in verses 3 and 4. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. Now, that, that's, that's pretty powerful, you know, for him to be saying that. I will not fear what flesh can do can do unto me. So let's go ahead and read the rest. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps. When they lie in wait for my life, shall they escape by iniquity? In anger cast down these people, O God. Verse 8. You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me. In God, I will praise his words. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. Again, I will not be afraid of what man can do to me. I won't be afraid. So, it is faith that helps us. To overcome fear. Now, when we put on the full armor of God, what is the one thing he told us to put up? The shield of faith. Because what does the shield of faith do? It quenches what? Every fiery dart. How many of you know that fear is a fiery dart? That is shot at your life, it is shot at your heart, it is shot at your mind every time you try to do something for the Lord. And the Bible says your faith, what you believe, what you know, what you stand on, what has never failed you and what will never fail you, you are to lift that and to trust in God for that fire, that shield to extinguish that dart. So faith conquers fear. How many of you know that love conquers fear? This is another thing we have to do. The Bible says in 1 John 4 and 18, For there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out what? Fear. When, when the scripture talks about perfect love casting out fear, Somebody share with what does that mean to you to have perfect love? Probably that word perfect, I didn't look that up. It probably means a mature or a strong love. Cast out all fear. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's obvious a person that's selfish and self-centered is probably going to have a lot of fear and trepidation in their life because a lot of their life is about them. When a person truly loves God, our life is no longer about ourselves, but it is about Christ and our life and our witness. Therefore, we don't think so much. We don't value as much trying to protect ourselves. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but the Bible says that he who would hold to his life would what? Lose it. And he that gave it away would what? Gain it. So that's to me is a perfect love is that you lay down your life for your brethren. You're, you're willing to lay your life down for everything in life. That kind of love ejects fear from your life. If you are truly a servant, if you are truly listening to God's voice, your eyes are on his call, then that love will cast out all fear. So the scripture goes on to say, you know, as we were talking about constructive or reverential fear, he said, but our text said, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Some people believe Jesus is telling here uh, to fear Satan, but Satan does not have 
this kind of power. He cannot destroy. He may be the destroyer, but a child of God has that shield around them in, in life. And so he's saying unto us here that only God has the power and the right to cast both body and soul into hell if, if uh, we do that. So um, I'm going to turn to 1 John 4 and 18. I'm going to kind of wrap it up with this. 1 John 4 and 18. He goes on to say, I'll back up to verse 12, and then I want to I go over into the fifth chapter. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So if we love one another, truly love one another, God abides in us, and it's been perfected. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So the, here's the point. If you have God in you, you have a love inside you that defeats fear. And verse 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love, we love him because he first loved us. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. How many of you in here have ever gone through a season to where Satan really got hold of your heart and gripped you in fear? I have. It is the most miserable walk that a person could walk. It is nerves tore up. It is body getting sick. It is all types of things happening. And you, we do go through trials. And we will go through trials that our faith can be strengthened. But we know when we go through things and we experience fears like that, it reminds us that we have more to cast and to roll on God than we have cast on him yet. You know, because when we're having that kind of fear, we're having doubts about life. We're having doubts about our family. We're having doubts about our finances. We're having doubts about all kinds of things. And God did not intend us to walk in that vein. Amen? For, and then uh, chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. And if that's you today, you do not have to fear. I like our text where he says, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, y'all heard this preached before, I'm sure. He didn't say they were counted. He said they were numbered. To count means he knows exactly how many is on top of your head right this minute. The word numbered declares that he knows how many you had from the time you was a bald-headed little baby to the time you got every little hair and you lost it all the way that you go to the grave. That is a meticulous God. That's how much he cares for you. So he says... Do not fear. So he says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of the birds, he says, falls to the ground. Apart. Can, can you imagine that scripture? Not one of the birds, the sparrows, falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. That is mind-boggling. I'd sit there and be saying, Jesus, ain't you got more to do than watch the birds? 
But yet, he is God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He can do all things. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. And there's nothing that goes. If, if we will see that here tonight above all things, you are so valuable to him. He knows you inside out. And yet he loves you. He loves your imperfections. He loves what you're doing for, for him. He loves even the times that you don't feel like you're growing. Like He loves you no matter what. And it is that kind of love that he has to say, then are not, do not fear, you are of more value than the sparrows. Wow. Fear must go. We're going to see it crop up like never before in the days to come. But do not fear. Do not fear what man can do to you. He can only kill your body but he cannot kill your soul or your spirit. Neither can he condemn them to hell. Only God can do that. The Bible says in Proverbs that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Where there is no fear of the Lord, there is not the correct knowledge that we need in our life. And so let us trust him in everything that we do. Amen.